Welcome to another edition of the Reddit Said It podcast. This is a very special edition because we have the one, the only, Candy Thunder here as our special guest today. She finally agreed to get on camera and actually talk with me. Hi, babe. Hi. How are you doing? I'm nervous as hell. Really? Yes. It's just you and me. I know. It's just you and me and a couple of cameras here. All of these things you're used to. So it's, and stories. You mean a bunch of assholes. Yeah. That's uh, that's all it is today. So I actually found the story. So yeah, so I have a head start. You have a head start, and you already know what we're talking about. I have no idea because I haven't read any of these. So you are more prepared than I am. Um, you know what the format is for today. If this is your first time watching the podcast, we are going to read through some um, "Am I the Ask Cannot" stories. And some of these come from Reddit. Some of these are follower submissions. So we'll have a mix of them in here. Is it just one? Reddit story and the rest of follower submissions today. Do you remember? Uh, they are all from Reddit today. All from Reddit today. Okay, cool. Yep. No follower submissions on today's podcast. Uh, two of them, though. No, three we were tagged in. Um, and two of them, I think Tony found on the internet, not just on Reddit. But Gotcha. Okay. So a mix of stuff. All right. So we've got a good blend of stories today. Before we get into that, we've been talking about you doing the podcast uh, for a while and there are all kinds of things that people want to know and want us to talk about and what we can probably do is just sprinkle a little bit of that in in between stories here so that we don't spend an hour talking about ourselves one of we the first a whole podcast just about we could we absolutely <laughs> we probably life. will be able to carve this up into a whole different show just about just about all madness one of the things that they wanted to know was how we met that's a pretty common one so uh, yes do you want to take the lead on that so we actually met for the first time when I was 16, which would have made you, what, like 20, 21? Uh, yeah, 1920, 20, 20-ish. Okay. So I started working at Outback as a hostess. Uh, you were a server, and that's how we met. I thought he was really cute. Um, he didn't know I even existed. It's not true. <laughs> yes, it is. No, but she was 16. I wasn't allowed to know she, she <laughs> that's existed. That's very true. So you were a gentleman. Yeah. Even then. Yeah, if you want to call it that, Sure. So okay. we, we worked together at Outback Steakhouse uh, for a few years, mm -hmm. and and really our lives didn't intersect then. We just happened to work at the same place, but um, then our lives went separate ways. Oh, wait, I have to mention that you looked totally different, too. Yeah. You had like short, spiky hair, no beard. <laughs> you were 100% clean shaven. Yeah, uh, and I had very spiky hair, too. Those were my heavy metal days. Yeah, like I, and you had lots of pins. That you wore very proudly. Yeah. From my Outback. Outback flare, of yes. course. That was back in the day when they wore flared Outback. Now it's not like that. No. Just like all black or something. Yeah. Something boring. It's very different now. I had a nice collection of pins. <laughs> Those were the heavy metal garage band days. So, like, I don't know. I don't know. Very That's probably why I was into you. It's very different. To, I was because I was the bad boy. No, you weren't. Because I looked like the bad boy. <laughs> you wanted to be a bad boy, but you were too nice. That's okay. I'm all right with that. So we worked together for a while there, and then our lives went separate, completely separate ways. Like you got married and had a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I got married and had a kid, and then. Uh, oh, but you came in. Remember when I was working at Cheddar's? I was yes. still in college. Yes. And you came in. You sat in my section. You asked me on a date. Yeah. And but this I had was, just of started dating someone else. Right. And. Yeah, she turned me down. <laughs> well, I was in a relationship. I know. Well, as you should have. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So Candy Thunder crushed my soul once. Well, you crushed mine when I was 16, so. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry that I was uh, a few years older and you were. Off limits? Yeah. Sorry. So life goes completely separate directions for 10 years. And then I was planning to do a series of commercials for a local car dealer and was like scripted out. Not the typical car dealer spot, but a, but an actual like story, and um, and was looking for like a, a school teacher type, uh, like a, a young pretty school teacher type to to cast in this in this spot, and uh, James, who's our brother in law, yeah, beer today, beer today, who has been on the podcast as well, actually suggested Candy Thunder as as a person to fill that role, um, and. For for you, this was a really it wasn't an awkward time, but but this was very out of character to agree to do something like that for you, right? Correct. Yeah, I did not. Um, I don't like being on camera. I don't at all. Like I'm completely uncomfortable right now. But doing this for you. Um, but I had gotten divorced uh, 
a couple of years prior and I was trying to do things that were out of my comfort zone, um, trying to be outside the box. And so I agreed to do the commercial and I was completely like sweating the whole time because I was so freaking It nervous. could have fooled me. I mean, she was great. Uh, and obviously, you know, I was just in awe because she was drop dead gorgeous and just very sweet and, <laughs> and nice and intelligent. So um, this was at a time in my life where I wasn't in a relationship. Uh, and, and the funny part is that you and I kind of both got to this point, and I talk about this quite a bit, but you and I both got to a point in our relationships where we were happy you know, we had kids, we had careers that we cared about. We were, we had decided to become independent and not need someone else in our life. Right. And I think that's why in that moment it was, I don't, I don't need someone. And you were like, I don't yeah. need someone. And because of that, there wasn't this pressure on needing someone in each other's lives. And I think that's why it worked out. So, so, uh, during the filming of that commercial, there was, it was really muddy. Um, and we were, we were kind of out in the woods on this muddy trail and I had to actually pick her up and lift her over mm -hmm. this pile of mud. Um, and that, that was kind of the moment that, that spark started flying. Yeah. I mean, I saw you and was like, oh, he's still cute. I still have a crush on him from when I was 16. Um, and then like you had messaged me about the commercial and, um, like we got to talking, like you said, and just realized that we were both in the same place in our life. And I think you actually offered me the job first because you said you knew that I had experience yeah. with books and keeping right. books. And um, so you had offered me the job and then like we decided to, what was it? Hang out. Yeah. We decided to hang out. You didn't ask me Man, on a real okay. day. <laughs> I was a chicken shit. Uh, but first of all, it, because she had some, some real life work experience in the advertising industry and I was getting ready to purchase the ad agency that I had worked at for a while. Um, really wanted to recruit recruit her to handle the media side of the business, um, and that was that was like mission number one. But during that process of getting to know her more and talking through business stuff, I fell in love with her, and um, it's like a chicken or the egg thing. But like the the driving force behind it at first was was to have her join the agency and and fill this job, but. It just so happened that during that process, mm -hmm. I think we fell in love. So, um, so now we own this agency together and manage a team together and try to manage a family and it's, and have a toddler now too, <laughs> because we're super smart like that. And, uh, yeah, it's like life isn't challenging enough. We like to find new ways to make it right. more challenging. Oh, and then we started this. It's like, we don't have enough going on. Let's start this side hustle adventure as well. Yeah. It's a constant, uh, running from. A to B to C. Yeah. And then back to A. We're like just taxis for the teenagers and navies just were at her. <laughs> run her around in home. a vehicle for the teenagers and run around physically at home for Navy. Yeah. It's it's interesting. Life keeps us just crazy busy. But our, our blended family is, well, in the beginning was um, Candy Thunder has a daughter who was, what, just entering elementary school at the time? Uh, no, she was four. Our girls are actually elementary school. yeah five weeks apart, so they were both four when we met. God, it's been so long; like it's just it's wild. But but she had Ava, and then I had um, Caden is the oldest. Karen and Brady are really close together, um, and then we have Navy, who is almost two. And <laughs> yeah, and as I mean, everything that you would expect from a blended family where where the next oldest kid is like 10 years older than she is. It's she's exactly the little adorable monster you would expect her to be. Yeah. There were 12 years between my two pregnancies. So, which is crazy, but I mean, our, you know, the oldest one has moved out, but the three teenagers are like her entire world, like yeah. everything they do, like she wants to be a part of, she calls for them at, from the bottom of the stairs she doesn't understand that they're not there all day, every right. day. <laughs> when they're at school, yeah. Just hollers in the foyer. KK! <laughs> Baba! Ada! What does she call Ava now? She calls her Data? Data. Data. She's, she's been through some evolutions of names with Ava. It's funny. Anyway, that's that's how we met in, in a little bit of a sh the short version of, of kind of the evolution to this point. Uh, also... You'll see me sipping on this throughout our podcast today. It is the jolt coffee that I always have on hand when Candy Thunder isn't thumping microphones with her fist. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> You've heard me talk about this before, but Jot really is some amazing coffee, and you can check some out and get a discount on it at jot.co using code DUSTY20. I feel like I should be like... Do your Vanna White thing? <laughs> yeah. It really is tasty. You actually do drink it. It's I not drink just, it a lot. You're not just pushing it to push it. Yeah. It's not like I'm saying Jot and I've got some other crap in here or anything. It's actually because uh, Starbucks costs so much damn money that I found an alternative solution and it's actually better, I think, than Starbucks. Yeah. It, for you, it anyways, is. Maybe it not is. For it people. absolutely is. And the creamer that I use is sugar free, dairy free. So, you know, there's there's limited side effects for me. It gives me the, uh, it gets me to the level of cracked out that I need to be to record this kind of stuff and record the normal TikTok videos. Um, but also, yeah, it, if I, if I ordered like a normal off the menu Starbucks rank, it probably wouldn't be an issue, but I have to have like the, <laughs> the double espresso frappuccino with an extra shot and, you know, coconut milk and sugar free everything. And $13 later. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> the problem is that it ends up, ends up being complicated and expensive. But my bigger thing is every time I go to Starbucks, there is a massive line of assholes in the parking lot that, that give zero shits about anything except for getting their coffee. And it's, it's wrapped around the building and sometimes it's like that inside too. And I'm like, man, you know, in 30 seconds I could make just as good a cup of coffee and not have to go anywhere for it. And a lot of the work that I do is in the middle of the night. So if I can walk into the kitchen and make this in 30 seconds and walk right back to my desk and rock and roll, there's so much more benefit and value in that for me. So I love it. Thank you for finding it for me, Candy Thunder. You're welcome. Always <laughs> looking out for me. Okay. Um, did you want to cover another question or do you want to dive in on store eyes? Uh, Candy Thunder is the boss here, guys. You know that. Tell us one time you messed up in your marriage. Laugh out loud. <laughs> Each of us? Or just me? Oh, probably just you. <laughs> I don't think I've ever messed up. <laughs> oh, I don't think we want to go there, do we? Oh, I know what it is. I know where I know what it is too, and I don't think we want to go there, do we? What when you bought a truck without oh God, without I knew telling this me this was going to happen? <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Okay, but I did love the truck. I did love it. <laughs> so here's the short version of the story. I had had my eyes on a truck for a while, and you know, only wanted it if I could get the the it was a tundra toyota tundra only wanted it if i could get the trd pro in army green and it was like you know the chances of finding one are are like one in a million so i was like well if if this unicorn ever appears then i'm down otherwise like whatever so uh i get a call from my buddy at the toyota dealership and he's like uh this dealer has has it and we have the truck that they're looking for so they're going to do a swap for us and we'll have it here in like two days so are you ready to rock and roll and I was like, oh, shit. Uh, I had no knowledge of this. Like, what's over? I knew that he wanted a truck. Like, we had talked about it months prior, but it was never like a, yeah, let's do this. It was never a for sure thing because it was like a one in a million unicorn kind of thing. And yeah. then it happened. It happened. And I was going to be a giant astronaut if I was like, oh, no. Uh, no, I'm out now. At least I felt like I was going to be. And I really wanted the truck. So that's truly how he is. Too. Yeah. That's like the kind of person that he is. Oh, no. Oh, no. So, so like I had already, I felt, I felt like I had already verbally committed to this. So, so what did I do? I sent you an email. It was like, hey, you here's what me, happened. You sent me an email in the middle of the night, the night before you were supposed to go do the paperwork to pick it up. You know, sometimes you get yourself <laughs> painted into a corner that you don't oh, know how to get out of. No, but. <laughs> So I hadn't checked my email. I was I went through this phase where I was like, I don't check my email till I walk in the office because I don't want to have stress before I get there. So <laughs> I go, I get to the office and there are other people here. It's not just me. Um, and my first email that I read from you is blah blah blah, <laughs> and I'm like immediately just raging, angry, and I can't even talk to you because you're at a shoot at a casino. In Oklahoma. Was working. Yeah, wasn't wasn't just there. No, but, you weren't yeah. just blowing <laughs> more there, money yeah, at a like, casino. <laughs> <laughs> I got a truck. I'm just <laughs> blowing money. <laughs> no. It wasn't like that. And it and it was for work too. Like it was uh mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was. It mm-hmm. was uh it was a company vehicle. But um <laughs> but I felt like I had already committed to it and I had to follow through with it and I knew that I was gonna be in trouble, but there was nothing that I could do at that point, except for just, you know, take my licks and move on. But, um, a decision of that magnitude, not communicating about it ahead of time. And, and really before 
expressing the commitment level to the dealer that I apparently had, uh, it caused some issues. I mean, it, it was a tense couple of weeks, right? It was like two days. It felt like a long time. Yeah. Oh, but you knew that you had. Oh yeah, that I, you had messed up. I knew I had screwed up, uh, but I just felt like there wasn't there wasn't a way to fix it. So, so it was like make the Toyota dealership mad or make your wife mad, and you were like, eh, my <laughs> wife will be there. <laughs> I felt like I had a better chance of smoothing it over with you. That's probably not accurate at all. No, it's just the type of person that you are. Like, if you feel like if he commits to something, he commits to something. And he normally, he really, really gets upset when plans don't go a certain way. And so he's, he commits, he commits. I'm, I'm probably OCD like that. And I'm probably on the spectrum a little bit when it comes to that. And, and even yesterday, which was my, my birthday, um, like I had a plan and that plan fell apart in every way you could you could possibly imagine it falling apart. And and that's fine, it but... It didn't just fall apart. It was like it was somebody lit it on fire. Yeah. Uh, that's fine, except for like me, whenever I have a plan and that plan doesn't work, it is very destructive for me. Like it's very mm-hmm. defeating and I feel like I just have no control over anything and it's just, it's tough. So uh, this, is, this was another one of those situations where I was like, I, I had a plan uh, and that plan just completely melted down and I was just stuck in damage control um and luckily luckily we communicated our way out of that pickle and moved on from it and she really liked the truck so it was a very nice truck it was a nice truck (laughs) but yeah that was uh that that was a huge screw up for me and i've obviously learned a lot from it um and uh and don't plan on making any unauthor unauthorized vehicle purchases in the future, you did. <laughs> I said in the future. Now she's about to bring up an occasion where where I did something for her, where it was it was like the day of her baby shower, and she had always said uh, she she drives a Highlander, but had always said if this this newer um, the sport model body of the Highlander came available locally, that that was the only one that she would ever trade in for. Well, my same buddy at the same car dealer called me up and is like, hey, if you wanted, it's here. And I'm like, okay, bet. So I take her car and I go trade it in and come home with the newer version that was the one that she said that she wanted. So it was, I did it as a gift for her. That wasn't like, that's not the same. It's not the same as me, you know, buying an additional truck for me. It was, it was trading in your car. What did I say? To get the upgrade that you wanted. I said that I couldn't accept this because then I could never bring the truck up again if and I accepted a accept new car. It. And here we are yeah. talking about the truck. Look at that. <laughs> well, somebody asked. I, I understand, but... Uh, Let's see who asked. We, now we can't bring one up without oh. bringing the other. Well, that was fun. Thanks, guys. I'm glad you, glad you asked about you know my epic screw-ups. Let's move on from that as quickly as possible. Have I ever had an epic screw-up? No, baby. You're perfect. That's what I thought. <laughs> No, I really am trying to think of one time that I've like, oh, I've made you mad, but he says that I am I am a pushover when it comes to the kids, like a hardcore pushover. And he's like, you're a pushover with everyone except for me. The only person that she means no with is me. <laughs> <laughs> Animals, children, everything. She's like, no, fine. <laughs> it's like I'm not that a pushover quick. like outside the, it's just with our kids and our animals. Correct. Like, at, I'm, I'm the opposite Correct. of a pushover. Yeah, but with the world, kids and the animals, it's it's no means wait 30 seconds. With me, yeah, they wear me down. With me, no means like if you even attempt to deviate from what this is, <laughs> I will light you on fire. That's what it means. You would never do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if daddy comes home with another truck, she might. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what kind it is. <laughs> If she really likes it, I'm safe. Yeah. Anyway, enough about um, all of my major screw ups. No, I don't think there's anything big like that, that that you've done that I can be like, oh, this was huge. IVF was hard. That was that IVF made me a really little hard. a little emotional. Yeah, which is one thing that people like, like you drew on those experiences, and people like called you out for being being an asshole. Somebody rated you an ass con three because you brought up pregnancy. I'm like, I I get to talk about it. I've I've been there at, at Dude, every. You, you gave me shots like yeah every day. For, I was the one administering the needles for IVF. Yeah, yeah. 
We, you go through that together as a couple. That is not like a, a one person thing. And if somebody is going through that alone, that sucks. Cause it, yeah, that's a roller coaster. It really, really was. It was hard. All right. So. You ready to jump into a story? I am. Let's do it. All right. Story number one here. Hey, also, um, it may be too late to mention this, but, uh, in the description for this, we'll have time codes for all of the stories too. So if you ever want to skip our banter, that's pre-story or in between stories, we'll have time codes for the actual start of the stories that you can skip ahead to here. So yeah. we'll dive into our very first story. This one is, am I the ass cannot for getting my daughter a hotel room entirely for herself after her stepsisters made her sleep on the floor? My dad passed away two weeks ago. Me, my wife, Candace, which is the name that OP chose as the incognito name for the wife here, which is just serendipitous because we've got Candy Thunder right here. It happens to be my name. And my daughter, 16, Shiloh, and her stepsisters, 19 and 17, who apparently don't have names, flew to my hometown to attend the funeral. After that, we got two hotel rooms, one for me and Candace, one for the girls. While I was in the room, I got a call from Shiloh at 11 p.m. crying and sounding like she was arguing with her stepsisters. I asked what was the matter, and she told me that her stepsisters insisted that she sleep on the floor. There was one large bed in the room, and there was enough space for all three girls to sleep on. I asked why, and she said she didn't know. I went to see what the issue was and talked with my stepdaughters about it. They kept talking, but didn't really explain why they told her to sleep on the floor. They just shrugged and said, It's better this way. We're more comfortable this way. I told Shiloh to grab her things, and when one of my stepdaughters asked where we were going, I told her I was booking her a hotel room. Both looked upset, but didn't say anything, but they must have called their mom because she was awake when I got back and started arguing with me about giving Shiloh an entire hotel room for herself. I explained why I did it, but she said I wasted money and that Shiloh could have sucked it up for one night on the floor. I called her unreasonable for saying this, but she told me I've showed the girls that I'm playing favorites and made my stepdaughter share a room while I gave my daughter an entire room for herself. We went home and Candace is still bringing it up saying I mishandled this. She even pointed out how my stepdaughters are upset since they're not speaking to me. Edited to add, it was Candace who got a room for the three girls to not stir any drama and save money. She was in charge of the hotel reservation since I was emotionally distressed. Also, Candace did not expect Shiloh to sleep on the floor. She wanted all three girls to share the bed. Edited to add number two, for those that are calling me an asshole for giving my daughter her name, her mom did that and she's deceased, so please let's not focus on that. Oh wow, that was apparently a thing. What's wrong with the name Shiloh? Uh, Something we don't know about, clearly. And also, I've known my stepdaughter since they were little. We're pretty much family, and Candace is a stay-at-home mom. But I give her full access to my money since this stuff was already discussed beforehand. Pretty much everything was. Full access to my money. They're married, right? Yeah. That's, that was a weird statement. That was a weird statement. I But we've talked about on here before that people keep separate fam- couples keep separate finances and it's just a that's a case by case couple by couple personal preference thing so i guess we just have to toss that one out the window okay so what are your thoughts here is op the ask not for getting his daughter a hotel room entirely to herself after her stepsisters made her sleep on the flow uh, absolutely not i mean why didn't they have a hotel room with two queen beds to begin with i mean maybe it's a small town maybe they have one i'm not sure but it seems like the logical solution was to have a hotel with two queen beds two for the bio sisters and then one for the stepsister step into his wife's shoes for a second here she's pissed that he went and got another room yet her original intention was for all three girls to sleep in the same bed why wouldn't she be pissed at her daughters oh for sure for not allowing his daughter to sleep in that bed because that was her plan instead of getting mad at them for pitching a fit and making the girl sleep on the floor which is what caused the drama that led to the extra room she's only mad at him for getting the extra room well and she said that he was playing favorites but i mean she's also playing favorites if she thought his daughter could just suck it up and sleep on the floor i mean why didn't her daughter just suck it up and sleep on the floor that was the She's playing favorites by not being pissed at her daughters for forcing his daughter to sleep on the floor. So, And I think one of the big things is that this is his dad's funeral. I mean, this is his, like, there shouldn't be any kind of drama, especially this crap. Like, she should have booked a room with two beds or booked three rooms so that you don't have three people in one bed. I mean, these are older girls. They're not younger. 19, 17, and 16. yeah, Yeah, these are full grown girls, so. 
Which, I mean, three of them in one bed, I, I get their opposition to that. But do you think that he was playing favorites by getting his daughter her own room? Uh, no, I don't. There's do three girls. If they do two rooms, one of them's going to end up in their own room. I don't think it effing matters which one of them it was. It was naturally her because she was the one being forced to sleep on the floor. Like right. that's, that's all there is to it. Now, her daughters have their own room together. And his daughter has her own room. I don't think there's any favorites involved here. I think really this does go back to mom by not getting onto her girls for forcing Shiloh to sleep on the floor. Yeah, I mean, if this was, I mean, we have a blended family. So if this was us, we would have, I mean, we would have both stepped in at that point. And I mean, we would have already had the other room because they're older. So of course they're going to need more space. But if we only no, had no. one room, let's say, let's say if we only had one room. And we had you know, three girls and we needed them all to sleep on one bed and they were forcing one to sleep on the on the floor. What would you say to the kids? I'd say the person that was forcing someone to sleep on the floor would be the one that would be sleeping in the floor. There you go. That's what should have happened. And I mean, yeah, if they think it's fine for someone to sleep on the floor, then there you go. There, have yeah. at it. Solution. OP took the what he thought was the least drama creating route, which was just enough of the BS, I'll just get another room, which <laughs> in turn created more BS. Oh yeah. And, and I mean, I just, I go back to like, if this was, if this was you and something had happened in your family, like I'm going to do whatever I can to not burden you with any kind of crap. Like I would have been, tried to be, to squash the situation before it even started. Like, and, and more BS. And instead of creating yeah, more BS she, and drama right. by attacking me for we're trying to provide some kind of solution you would have handled it with the kids before it ever got to that right i feel like yeah. you and i would have walked in there as a unified front and be like enough bullshit <laughs> you cut like, the crap yeah either either like put your heads on opposite ends and you can all three sleep there or whoever's being the ass bag right now gets to sleep <laughs> on the floor right that's all there is to it or we would have had two rooms in the first place yeah right Okay, so um, I'm I'm thinking OP. We are not putting on the Ascon scale here. Um, no, but I definitely think his wife is on the Ascon scale, and so are the the stepsisters for trying to throw her into the floor. This kind of feels like the like Cinderella thing. It does, yeah. Uh, so where would you put Mom on the Ascon scale here? Like I know the scale by heart, but I can't remember it right now. Ask on one is there's no way you should have done that. You're a terrible human being. Ask on two is you definitely shouldn't have done it, but you're not a terrible person. Ask on three is you definitely shouldn't have done that. Ask on... Well, ask you on probably th shouldn't have done that as four. Yeah. I'd say she's probably a three at least. And I think the stepsisters might be a two because you definitely don't kick someone into the floor unless they're willing to sleep in the floor. Or if you are uncomfortable, then you get in the floor. Yeah, so they ganged up on her. Yeah. I guarantee that this is not the first time this has happened. Yeah. It's just exacerbated by close quarters. Right. So mom was what, a three, you said? Mm hmm And the girls are two? Yeah. I can agree with that. I can get down with that. OP does not make the ask on scale. Mom, I think, ends up there because instead of being a solution provider here, she set up an environment that I think she probably knew was going to cause drama. And then instead of getting onto her girls for creating drama, got onto the husband who's already dealing with a loss. Right. For him trying to provide some kind of solution. So, right. cool. Good on you, mom. And the fact that she got onto him for playing favorites when that's exactly what yeah. she did when she told the, the girl to suck it up. So Nice hypocritical argument, mom. Yes. Good job. Okay, so we've got an Ask on 3 and a couple of Ask on 2s yeah, there. She did not do my name justice at all. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, and this was a Reddit story. This wasn't a follower submission, but but helpful tip if you're going to provide a follower submission, probably avoid using Candy Thunder's name as an alias in there. Okay. Does everyone know your name? Uh, my name's Dusty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mean my real name? Yeah. Uh, I mean, probably not. Mm -hmm. But I think I think Dusty and Dustin are, you know. So I used I go, to hate the name Dusty. I though. know. So I go by Dustin. Uh, my my that's my my real name is Dustin. Dusty is my stage name for this character, um, and it's 
I, I have I have a character that I've created for this because it's easier for me to step into the role of Dusty Thunder and like none of this bothers me as Dusty Thunder, um, but Dustin is my my Muggle name. This bothers me as Candace and and Candy. Oh, both. No, 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 no. So yeah. it's I mean the first time sure, but Candy Thunder will be an old pro at this in no time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's you just have to define who Candy Thunder is, like who you want Candy Thunder to be. An introvert. Oh, okay. A scared introvert. (laughs) Candy Thunder is way different than Candace. Yeah. Way different. I excel at a one-on-one conversation without a camera. Candy Thunder is an empath. It's hard to be empathetic with a camera. Cameras don't have feelings. Do they? Do you feel, camera? Okay, we're going to take a quick break um, and we will come back and chat a little bit more and dive into our second AITA story here shortly. Stand by. We're going to go ahead and dive right into our next story. This one is, am I the ass cannot for not spending this Christmas in the hospital with my daughter? My 39 female daughter, 16 female, has had a sensitive stomach ever since she was a kid. There are certain foods that will upset her stomach to the point where she's unable to stop throwing up. We've seen countless doctors, but so far nobody's been able to give us a clear answer. The only advice we keep getting is to identify all trigger foods and cut them out from her diet. We have a pretty good idea of what those foods are. Soda and other carbonated drinks, chips, Cheetos, and other similar processed snacks. Anything oily or fried and most sweets. Unfortunately, this is exactly the kind of stuff my daughter loves to eat the most. And as horrible as she feels after she has them, she still refuses to cut them out of her diet, which in turn led to her spending a lot of time in the hospital during the past few years. When she was little, it was easier to keep all these foods away from her because I simply wouldn't buy them. But now she's older. I can't always be there to check what she eats. She eats the greasy pizza at her school's cafeteria. She trades her own lunch with classmates. She goes out with her friends and stops to eat at KFC and so on. And it always ends with her in the ER, crying and shaking because she can't stop throwing up. This was the case on this Christmas Eve as well, when our whole family gathered at our place. And of course, among the many dishes at our Christmas table were some of her main trigger foods like chips, soda, chocolate, and sweets. Now mind you, these were far from the only foods available to her. We also had a variety of home-cooked traditional dishes on the table with ingredients that don't upset her stomach, like vegetables, meat, dairy, etc. All of them delicious and well-seasoned. My daughter herself says she really likes most of these dishes. Despite this, my daughter chose to eat nothing but her trigger foods. I reminded her that they'd make her feel awful, but she said she didn't care because Christmas is only once a year and she just wants to live a little. Well, this ended with her violently throwing up in the ER a few hours later. She had to be hospitalized for a few days and only just got out of the hospital a few hours ago. And unlike the previous times when something like this happened, this time I chose to spend my Christmas relaxing at home with the rest of our family and not in the hospital by my daughter's side. I kept in touch with her through calls and texts and told her if she needed anything, I'd ask a family member to bring it to her, but I made it clear that I would not be visiting during her stay. And well, my daughter didn't take this too well. She cried every time we talked on the phone, begged me to come over, told me how horrible I was for abandoning her there all alone, and so on. Most of our family didn't take my side in this either. And during the past few days, I got called everything from a little extreme to downright cruel and heartless. Am I the ass cannot? How old is this girl? 16. What say you, Candy Thunder? Um, I'm like completely mixed on this because I would, I say I would have a hard time abandoning my 16 year old on Christmas day in the hospital, but I feel like at 16, she's lived with this her whole life. Like she knows what she can and can't eat and she knows what eating this certain food is going to do to her stomach. So I feel like she, I mean, she made the call knowing where she would end up because she ate this food. And I don't think that the mom, I'm not going to call it punished, but maybe shouldn't be punished to sit in the hospital with her all day. And maybe this is the wake-up call that she needs to to not eat like this again. It sucks. It sucks that she can't have the food that she wants to eat when she's, because it makes her sick. But Why would she choose that, though? Why, why would she choose knowing that she's going to end up back in the ER with this incredible pain. Why would you choose pain? Why would you touch the hot stove over and over again? And she said that she was, you know, packing her lunch and then going to school and trading it. So she's constantly, like you said, just touching the hot stove. Choosing pain. And I I don't understand that. And the mom was there. I mean, could she not stop her from eating those things? 
I guess, I mean, can you stop a 16 year old from eating what they want to eat at a family event? I don't know. Oh, well, she gave her the warning and she said, I mean, she gave her the warning at the dinner and told her, told her what was going to happen. And she said she didn't care because Christmas was once a year and she wanted to live a little. Well, living well, a little like she's for already her, been living yeah, for the whole year. But living, living for her means dying. Literally. I mean, she's, she's injuring herself by making these choices. That's not living. Like, no. why, do, why, why does she think that that's living? I guess that's something that, that has to be drilled down upon, like figure out why, why she chooses to feel that way. That's, that's right. what I don't get here. Maybe and this is, the, this is the question. lesson. Yeah. Th- there needs yeah. to be some kind of dive in here that mom's not going to be able to dive in on and figure out why she's choosing that pain over and over again. Is it attention? Like what, what is it that she, that drives her to choose these things over and over again and choose pain? My red flag alarms are going out or going on throughout this story. Thinking about the freaking medical bills that are being racked up just because she can't control herself enough to not eat the food that sends her to the ER. You and I would have had a conversation with the kids way beyond that and be like, look, if you're actively choosing these things, then you get to pay the medical bills. You're choosing to put yourself in there. You're choosing to cost this family thousands of dollars every time you do it. Don't do it. And she's choosing pain, but pain creates change. It's just, it's got to be a different kind of pain. Something that is severe enough for her to realize and change this behavior. And this might be the pain she needed, right? No, and I agree with that part. But I think, like, I'm stuck on why the mom hasn't had her in therapy. Like, if she does this over and over and over again. Obviously, psychologically, there's something. Yeah. Something is, like you said, is it the attention that she gets whenever she's in the hospital? Um, I mean, where's did, they didn't mention the dad in this, did they? No, um, they they really just talk about 39-year-old mom and 16-year-old daughter. And I mean, the rest of the family, but nobody else specifically is mentioned in here. So it's those are the only two specific people in play. The rest of the family obviously has their opinions. And maybe Christmas Day wasn't the time to choose to create this pain and try to change her behavior. Like, she obviously needs to change her behavior. She, Her and her daughter need to get on the same page. But maybe you're right. Maybe Christmas Day wasn't the day to do that. Man, but this is know. also a conversation that they had because, because the mom told her, you know, what would happen if she chose to eat those foods that were in front of her with the Christmas meal. And she said she didn't care. Yeah, she, she chose, chose it. She chose to go there and, and chooses maybe at this that over point, and over again. The the mom should have said, if you choose this, I will not be there. And maybe she should have given her that full warning instead of whatever it was she said to her. Yeah, this was an after the fact. She chose her punishment after the fact instead of making it clear ahead of time. I mean, in, in my head, if this is happening with my child, I'm they're just not allowed to eat those foods. and And that may sound harsh, but... At this point, she's 16, like you still know what's best for her and you have the right to say, like, no, we're not going to the ER. We're not doing this. This is the options that you have to eat. Right. If like, but it's those, that's your choices. I, I think in most cases, mom didn't have that kind of control because she would choose those things when she was away from home with her friends. This was like a rare instance where she knew that choice was being made in front of her. And that's why she doled out this punishment after the fact. But right. you're right. It needed to be communicated ahead of time and said, if you choose this and if you end up in the ER on Christmas because you chose to be dumb and eat foods that you know are going to make you violently ill to right. the point where you're going to end up in the ER. And we know this from experience then I will not be there. Choosing it after the fact was probably the one asshole thing that mom did here. Everything else I think is OK. And if this hadn't have been on Christmas and had been pre-communicated, I think she wouldn't be the asshole at all. Just yeah. think think of it this way. This is a 16-year-old girl. In two years, she's going to be away from home like in college or living on her own all the time. And mom's not going to be there to help babysit the food choices. She has to learn to start making better choices for herself without mom being there to helicopter everything and to make the choices for her. She has to learn to make those smart choices herself. And right now, just chooses the opposite of what she should choose every damn time. What are your thoughts on like having that food available in the first place do you think it should be available and she should just skip that food or do you think in their household like if we had a child that was this severely sick off of this type of food do you think we would make if she was 16 i i don't if she was 16 i think you have to you have to focus on training that child 
to look at the foods that she's not supposed to have and choose not to have them. Right. Because it's out there in the world. You're not going to, like, even if you limit it and just don't have that kind of stuff in your home, it's still there outside of the home. Right. And she still has to choose not to have it outside of the outside of the home. Not having it in the home, I, I don't think would be a good teaching element because it's just showing her that she can eat whatever she wants when she's at home because it's all safe. The dangers of the real world are still out there when she walks out the door. You're right. She's old enough to know, hey, this is, I shouldn't eat at KFC. I mean, that's yeah. 16, damn near an independent adult. You got two years to get this behavior changed. Right. Before she goes out there and does something really, really stupid and you're not there to fix it. So and maybe the lesson from this was, hey, you're almost a legal adult pretty soon. You know, wherever you are for college or wherever you are, whenever you choose to to become an independent adult, in whatever capacity that looks like, I may not be there to help fix things. And I may not be there in the ER with you. Right. I mean, so like here's you said, a taste. if she's away at college, then, I mean, who does she have there that's going to be taking her to the emergency room when she stops at Taco Bell or wherever she's headed? Yeah. it's it's She's got to learn to make better choices. And this maybe caused enough pain to change that behavior. Maybe Christmas Day and, and not warning her ahead of time could have been done better. So right. thinking of it that way, if we're talking about the ASCON scale, let me pull up keep so I cannot mud my way through it again. I don't know that I would put her on the scale at all. Mom? Mm-hmm. Well, okay. So I think that sometimes too, just because I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, I don't think this was an asshole thing, but what we did say was probably could have approached that differently, right? Right. Because it, it being on Christmas Day, is a factor and it not being pre-communicated is a factor as well. So those two things present this whole situation as you could have approached this differently. And maybe you're an asshole, maybe you're not, which just happens to be the definition of ask on four. So in these situations where, where we may not think that someone is necessarily the asshole, they're still on Mm -hmm. the scale because they could have done it differently. And we're not saying should have, because that would be ask on three. We're saying could have, you know, maybe Christmas day wasn't the time, maybe pre-communicating it, would have gone better um, and made you less of the asshole to everyone else that's looking in on this situation too. Something's got to give. We know that. We just don't know that Christmas Day and not not giving this warning ahead of time was the play. So you say ask on four? Say ask on four. I'm not going to put her on the scale. I'm going to disagree with you. That's fine. <laughs> you don't think she could have done it differently? Uh, I mean, you can do everything differently, but in this case, I think given how many times she's been to the ER, I think the mom was burnt out and the mom knew her limits and did what she had to do. She did what she had to do. Yeah. All right. So and we've, we've got a split opinion here and ask on four and it's like uh, barely a split and it's a like none. A yeah. You know, we're close. We're close to saying the same things, yeah. but I'm going ahead and put her, putting her on a four. I don't think she did the wrong thing. I think she did the right thing in the wrong way. Okay. Look at that. See this guy's, we're disagreeing in a very healthy way. It's crazy. I might be the first person on this podcast to disagree with you. That's how you're never going to be invited back. Okay. I'm just kidding. Don't don't tease me with <laughs> Look, a good time. Candy Thunder's in charge of podcast guests, so uh, or you know most of the time, except for that one time that I brought a comedian on and all hell broke loose. Oh yeah. People are so mad about that. Yeah, I know. Uh, and we talked about it on the last live, too. They're like, what happened to this podcast? And I'm like, well, I learned a valuable lesson. It's it's trying to find humor in these tense situations just doesn't turn out well. Trying to find the potential humor in all these situations. like It just it well, comes across harsh and wrong. I think uh, you can leave this out, but I think people want to. Like, people want there to be drama. They want to create drama, even if it doesn't exist. Like, like somebody said something to you on the live for bringing me on. Like, don't dictate to her what she should or shouldn't do. And I'm like, there's clearly no problems. Like, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't want to do it. Right. It's interesting that you say that because it's something that I was thinking about while we took our break before we came back in and started on this story, as I was looking at comments on, on the most recent posts that are out there, it's really easy for for people to run straight to worst case scenario and be like run divorce like Mm -hmm. you know it's the most common comments that we have are like run and divorce um and audacity and audacity yeah 
Uh, I, I just think it's interesting that people jump straight to these worst case scenarios instead of looking for a solution where people can change. And I mean, ultimately, if you're looking for a solution, if a solution is, is what we're trying to find here, and I think it is, we're at least trying to identify if it's possible to solve a problem, right. then, then giving people the opportunity to change is, is one of our responsibilities, not just going straight to divorce. Is that why you stopped using Ask on One? As, as often? No, yeah. I stopped using Ask on One as often because I really don't feel like we should create anything beyond it. I feel like the, the instant we start creating levels above ASCON 1, ASCON 1 loses all, its, all of its meaning. So I'm really trying to reserve it for like the worst of the worst. Not mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, and just to, I have disagreed with you on videos that you've... Oh, for sure. Yeah. I'm like, you totally missed the mark. You're yep. going to get roasted for this one. Yep. Yeah, it is not. I mean, it's it's uncommon. I'm not going to say it's rare, no, but it's like uncommon. Five or six, maybe. Yeah. And maybe, and at this point, you know, how many hundreds of videos have we done? So it's like... No, but the last podcast, I was like, "Yeah, well, and you that's, guys the mark that's on where we decided story. if there were anything, if there were any important notes that needed to be handed to us about stories ahead of time, that Candy Thunder is now providing those to make sure we don't screw it up again. Something we talk about more frequently now is our opinions are shaped by our life experiences, and even though you and I are married, we haven't lived the same life. We don't have the same opinions on everything, and we understand that we don't agree <laughs> on a lot of things, and we just try to do that in the most healthy way possible and understand each other's viewpoint and learn from it. I think it's the, the best thing you can do is try to learn from someone who has a differing opinion than you. It doesn't mean they're evil. You know what I mean? No, I agree. And you are, you are really good at looking at both sides of the equation. So I think that's important, especially when you're doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. You have to be diplomatic to find solutions. That's all there is to it. You're like a politician. <laughs> Great. I'm just kidding. I'm like a fun politician. I'm like the politician that would never get elected. Yes. <laughs> yes. The fun uncle politician. Too many skeletons in that closet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Too many. But on that note, uh, this is this doesn't have to do with anything. It's probably something we'll just edit right out. But I think it's interesting that we have this expectation of politicians that they're perfect human beings. Right. When none of but us we, are perfect. We also expect them to be a representative of the people. And nobody's flawless. And like if you took if you took the average person from a constituency it, that would definitely not be a flawless person right that person is going to have plenty of flaws but we have our representatives under this microscope that we would never apply to ourselves. and i just think it's funny i'm like really if you were going to choose a true representative of the people it would be someone who was uh who was divorced and like started their own small business and had been through a lot of shit you know what i mean no not not me i'm not saying me but i'm saying if you were if you were choosing someone who understood, like we, right, no, who I, we end up choosing as representatives are people who are never going to understand us because they've lived these these lives that leave them scarless. Right. I'd rather have someone in office that has made mistakes and learned from those mistakes yes. rather than pretending that they didn't smoke pot. Absolutely. If they want to do it. Do I'm it like, hell yeah, I did. <laughs> This is story number three, and this is, am I the astronaut for leaving my babies inside by themselves? I, 20, am a mother of triplets who are only two months old. I never expected ever in my life that I'd be a mother to triplets, so when I first became pregnant, it was definitely the last thing on my mind. I'm home with my babies all day long and had to even transfer my education to online. Sometimes I just need fresh air, especially when I can't get them to stop crying and I find myself getting super frustrated to the point of tears. It's honestly so hard and the dad isn't there to help as he's either at work or school. My fiance's 24 parents rented us a main floor apartment so when I step outside, I'm literally just sitting on the chair right beside the door. Plus, I have a baby monitor set up in their room and it has a camera on it so I can literally see them and hear them so if anything happened, I'd be able to quickly get to them. Being able to step outside for a few minutes to take a breather is really important to me because I start to have a mini panic attack when I can't get them to stop crying and I get really frustrated because I just feel super overwhelmed. Being able to go outside just gives me a chance to calm down. My fiance came home to me sitting outside while the babies were crying and freaked out on me calling me a horrible mom and a bunch of other names that I'm not going to list here. He thinks that I was super neglectful in putting the babies in harm's way and even told his parents now everyone seems to be really against me. I grew up in this system. 
My fiance's family is the only family I have ever known, so it breaks my heart that they are so upset with me. That I really don't think I was doing anything wrong or putting my babies in harm's way, but they seem to think otherwise. So here I am wondering if I should apologize for my actions or if I am the a-hole in this situation. Update, I decided to show my fiance this thread. At first, he was really upset with me for sharing our personal problems with strangers on the internet, even though it's anonymous. But in the end, when he had a chance to calm down and hear me and all of you guys out, he actually apologized and promised me he'd be more involved with parenting and even is willing to take parenting classes, which I will hold him to. I just want to thank everyone for the support that you all gave me. It brought me to tears, happy tears, seeing how supportive you all were to a stranger on the internet. I don't think I've ever received this much support before. I can't believe how much attention this post even got, plus the award again. Thank you so much. So maybe we should have talked about our thoughts before the update, but what are your thoughts here? Is it okay? You know, I, I read this when I when I found it in like hearing you read it just like broke my heart again because I feel yes 100% what this mom did is okay I mean they literally tell you to do that in the hospital walk away because crying babies like it's a trigger it can upset it makes you feel frustrated but I just feel so much for this mom I can't imagine being 20 years old and having triplets like that is a wow that is so much to put on yourself and especially like being home all day by yourself with three babies at 20 years old like that is not something that i could even and growing up in the system is just insult to injury there too because she never had a good model right for like how you're supposed to parent or how you're supposed to do things she's learning as she goes here and, and she never 20 year olds with triplets like what in the right. world well and for her fiance to come home and just completely like bash her for sitting outside which is what you're supposed to do if if you need a moment and she, like she said she had the camera she had the monitor if she needed to take a couple minutes away and just like reset herself, take some deep breaths, like there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And that, it honestly just makes me sad. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like this would probably be a discussion in comments and there will be a lot of differing opinions here. But in this specific instance, they have a main floor apartment. She sits right outside the door. She has the baby monitor, probably has the ability to get to them within five seconds, right? Ten max. And I would assume they're probably in their their crib cribs, like that's. Yeah, I mean, two if, months. Yeah, yeah, cribs or like in their in their swings or, or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're in in something, and she's watching them, so she has a camera it's on not them. Like she's like left them on the coffee table and yeah. the couch and walked away. Yeah, left left them by the uh, Martha Stewart knife set and <laughs> right. just just said, okay, peace, deuces. Um, the distance that she was from them is probably closer than you know people who are in like a medium-sized home and have their baby monitor and walk to the kitchen she was probably closer to them than most people are uh, but because she was outside of a door and just needed to breathe some fresh air maybe that's the issue here Uh, or just being away from them period what's more what's more risky is it more risky to to sit outside the door and be able to have eyes on them on a monitor to make sure nothing is happening and be able to take some deep breaths and get and gain your sanity or be sitting right with them and feel like you're about to lose your shit. Right. There's I more mean, risk involved with, with losing your shit. There is a legitimate reason that they make you watch that video in the hospital that says to walk away if you feel frustrated or feel like you're losing control of yourself. There's, yes. I mean, obviously like things have happened and I think, for being 20 years old, I mean, she did what she had to do to reset herself. Right. And to me, that's, I mean, do you see anything that she should have done differently? I mean, I know that you're, we have differing, differing opinions on this, so. No, I get it. And like based I, on our own I completely understand it. But yeah, I'm the, I'm, I'm the one that's terrified of everything he's, happening he's, to the kids. You're like the helicopter parent. Yeah. I'm the like laid back. Yeah. But I, I think it's also probably more common for for the parent who isn't there as much to be more afraid of everything. That's true. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. how it is for you and I. Like, I mean, we have a balance, but, you know, I'm away from the home more and you're home with Navy more. Right. And and I think that you have a lot more experience and comfort with with systems and with boundaries and, and with structure for her 
Um, and, and for me, it's just like, my brain goes right to the, like, what if this thing falls? What if she hurts herself doing this? What if this happens? What if this happens? Like, why are the scissors this close to the, the edge of the counter? Like that kind of crap. I'm always looking around. I'm always walking around looking for danger so that I can remove it. Um, and, but I have that irrational fear of her, like of heights with her. Like she's going to like leap out of my arms and fly off the, my parents like two story deck. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there, there are just things we, yeah, we absolutely have our, all have our things, but I think this is probably best explained by, you know, him not being as involved and right. coming home and seeing something that he didn't understand. Yeah. And, but why, why did he just like, what did he just call up his mom and was like, Hey, she did this. Mommy, she yeah. left my trip into like, the room all by themselves. Even though I wasn't here to help at all. So I just called her a bunch of bad names so and bad. told her she was a shitty mom. What? He didn't take the time to try to understand it. And that's that's where he screwed up here. So so OP is, to us, not on the ASCON scale at all because um, she's just trying to get by. But her fiancé, keep in mind their ages here. Yeah, too. I know. She's I was just thinking they're very young. Yeah, they're really young. It me and a young parent, you just learn as you go. Right. But, but you definitely don't call your mom up first thing whenever you're fiance that you you assume she makes a mistake you don't call your mom and tell her that your fiance made a mistake yeah that just move. just tip there for anybody who's wondering <laughs> that's going to cause more damage to your to your relationship than anything well and he painted her out to be some kind of like bad mom in this whole scenario when yeah. i don't think that's what was happening no i mean she did exactly what they teach you to do like you said right but he didn't understand it and i think his biggest error here aside from calling his mommy uh, was instead of taking the time to try to understand it and have that conversation about like, like explain to me, you know, your plan here and, and right. why this is okay. Explain to me why this is okay for you so that I can at least try to understand it. He can have an opinion on it, but without him trying to understand her point of view, he just, he made a verdict right then and called his mommy and made this a hundred times worse than it ever should have been. Right. Right. No, I agree. I mean, okay. if this was like you and I and you walked in and Navy was inside crying and you saw me outside on the verge of a breakdown, I think the first words out of your mouth would be like, what can I do? Well, how can I help? Right. And I don't know, maybe you wouldn't have asked that at 24. Maybe you would have assumed this and maybe I would have. That could be true. Yeah, I don't because know. Because at this point in life, I'd be like, okay, the best thing that I can do right now is to help provide a solution or provide support. Instead of flipping out and be like, what the hell are you doing? Right. But at 24, without that experience to know that, I don't know. Yeah. But that's how you learn, too. I think you learn by making mistakes. And in and, and the edit, she said that he like, he understood. He saw these responses that they gave on Reddit, and he was willing to change. So I think, I mean, to me, that's a really good sign. Yeah. He, he has the ability to learn. Now, there's nothing in here saying that he's going to walk back his bitch fit to his mommy. And that, you know, like yeah. patching things over with his mom is going to take more time and more effort, but that's on him. And I think that's, that's my big message here for OP is that, you know, he needs to understand that what he did there was wrong and he needs to smooth that over. Yeah, he needs to let his mom know that he overreacted to a situation and walk that back. Yep. So, uh, OP is not on the ASCON scale here. Where does her fiance land on the ASCON scale? So he pulled that back up. Yep. He made, he made a, an instant judgment and called his mommy instead of trying to understand the situation and okay. talk to her about it. That's a two. He definitely should not have done that. Doesn't make him a terrible person though, because he didn't, because he didn't have the experience to know better. And no, he's not a terrible person. I mean, he made a mistake, but I don't, I, in, in the little bit of information that we had, I would not call him a terrible person. Well, the update, I think, removes him from there. Yeah, he's willing to learn and he's willing to do better and help support her in the way that she feels that she needs supported. So I think that's that's a win. Yeah, that's that's what pulls. That's what prevents him from going to one is that he he's learning and growing from it. He still has to smooth it out with his mommy. Yeah. Uh, and if he had already smoothed that out, maybe he would have been a three. But but he, yeah. you know, he's not. He's in two categories. So we agree on this one? Um, yeah, 100%. There we go. The thunders are in agreement here. 